Good morning, great day to you all. Welcome to Oil for the Journey. It is, we are still in this 40 day live reading through God's Word. Today is day 23, y'all. What? <laughs> we are reading today uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses. Yeah, chapters five through eight. My apologies. <laughs> um, and so I just want to remind you all that we follow the Bridges for Peace, Ignite the Truth Bible Reading Plan. You can sign up at www.ignitethetruth.com. And uh, believe me, your life will never be changed. <laughs> Speaking of life, that's what we're doing. We are lifened by God's holy word, his amazing word, his wonderful word, his word that is alive, his word that is sharper than any two double-edged sword. I know I just, I know what I just did. <laughs> oh, but it is amazing and it can pierce through, through our hardened hearts if we allow it to all right so um i just want to remind you all what we mean by when we say life in, and then what is life in, and then what is life in by god's word so life in is daily life encounters that require us to expend massive amounts of amounts of energy whether we judge an experience to be good or bad, that life experience requires us to spend ourselves emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, intellectually, and socially. So when we are life and by God's word, we choose to trust God in his holy word to lead God, direct, redirect, influence, and encourage our daily lived experiences, whether they be good or bad, because to be near God is for our good. And he is trustworthy, y'all. Yes, he is amazingly. You can't trust no one more than you can trust God. <laughs> he never fails. He's not a man. And he can't lie. All right? So, <laughs> with that, I just want to take this time also to invite you all um, if you want to join me in this live experience, I don't know if you caught us on Tuesday, day 21. Yes, I had a friend of mine, Shakita. She came on and read with me. We read through the book of Ruth and it was so powerful. And then yesterday, another sister friend, Trisha, um, read for us for Samuel chapters 1 through 4. And that was amazing as well. And so you'll be excited to know once we come out of this live journey, you'll be able to see <laughs> our other journey friends reading along with us. Just amazing men and women with a heart for God. Right? I was going to say a heart of gold, but I was like, well, what does that really mean? <laughs> they have hearts for God. They love the Lord and they know that the Lord loves them. And they are persevering like the rest of us. To continue to live life 
right? By God's word, life and by God's word. That's what we're all here for. So, you know, if you want to join me, I'll be so excited to have you here. You can sign, uh, scan this QR code and it will give you, like, bring you to a form you can fill out and uh, we'll send you an uh, invitation, a link to join us here live. And for this amazing experience, being able to discuss God's word and to encourage one another um, to redo these stories, right? And this is building community because it's better with friends. We're good on our own, but we're better with friends, right? Two is better than one. So we thank God for that, that he is here with us. So if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at oilforthejourney at gmail.com. And you can also connect with us through our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, X, and YouTube. So um, before we begin, begin today's uh, reading, kind of... <laughs> I wanted to sort of kind of expound a little bit more or just add on something that's been on my heart um, since yesterday's reading. <laughs> so we, we read yesterday a lot about, we started with Hannah, right? And just how she was crying out to God and Eli, the priest, he thought she was drunk and she was like, no, I just, you know, I'm crying out to God because I really want a child. I really want a son. And she was like, you know, God gives me this son, I'll give him back to him. And so the Lord blessed her. She was able to give birth to the prophet Samuel. And so, you know, but there was something that God also had to, to do. He had to bring judgment upon Eli and his sons. Um, his sons were wicked priests. And here in uh, verse 11 through 14, of this is chapter three, which we read yesterday, it said, um, or Trisha read for us. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I'm about to do a shocking thing in Israel. I'm going to carry out all my threats against Eli and his family from beginning to the end. I warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. So I have vowed that the sins of Eli and his sons will never be forgiven by sacrifices or offerings. So basically, you know, there was nothing that they could do to sort of kind of um, turn God away from the wrath that he was about to pour out upon them. And it was interesting that he says, oh, because Eli did not discipline them. You know, and I started thinking about how in the world today we say, oh, you can't judge me. You did it. You're right. I can't judge you. Because I don't have a heaven or a hell to put you in. <laughs> I can't take your name out or put your name into the Lamb's Book of Life. I can't do it for myself either. God is the judge. But what I can do is speak to the fact of the wrong that I'm seeing. Or I want my brothers and sisters to speak to me and say, Sonny, um, you need to get together, bro. Get it together. <laughs> Because you are out of control. <laughs> and so I think that's just the level of accountability that we should have for one another. The love that we should have for one another to not want to see each other um, go astray. Be off the hook, you know, be out of control. <laughs> Whatever we want to call it. I can't really think of But um you know, I just really felt like I, sh I needed to, to say that in addition um, to, you know, yesterday. So I pray that that's encouraging, too, because we want to correct each other. And we want to correct each other in love, right? Remembering, you know what? I've been through the same thing or I have the opportunity to go through the same thing. And I am not stronger than anyone it is God's Holy Spirit who works through me who helps me uh, and sometimes I still you know don't do as I should ought to do but I thank God for his grace that abounds and that is the love of God that he has for me that he has for you that he has for all of us because it is not his desire for any to perish but for all to come to repentance and so 
I pray even as we're reading this word today, Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to be in your word. God, I thank you that you teach us, you correct us. Father God, you encourage us. And I pray all these things are happening today for all of us. Those of us who consider ourselves your sons and daughters. And those who may happen upon this video who don't even know you. But I pray that they would come to, to recognize that their eyes would be open to know that you love them, that you desire to be in relationship with them, that you're just asking them to come as they are. There is no form. There is no formality. There's, there's nothing we can do to um, be ready to come to you. We just need to come. It's to help us, Lord. Thank you. We thank you every day, Lord, because of your grace that abounds. We have everything we need to accomplish every task. We have what we need to be kind. We have what we need to be patient. We have what we need to forgive. Keep no record of wrongs. Lord, we have what we need to, to trust. We have what we need to um, move forward in spite of fear. We have what we need from you to maintain hope, a hope that does not disappoint. We have what we need to live. Thank you, Dad. Thank you for giving us your word, for giving us everything we need to live in this life, to thrive, to abound. And even when we feel low and abased or we feel like there's just so much coming against us, you are still present and you are still providing you are still protecting. And we bless you for it even now in the name of Jesus. So we thank you for this time in your word that you are present. Father, speak to our hearts. Soften our hearts where they need to be softened. And uh, encourage our hearts where they need to be encouraged. Because you said you would never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right, you guys, let's get started. <laughs> Again, we're reading through 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel, chapters 5 through 8. I'm in the NLT, New Living Translation. So you can follow along in this specific translation if you wish. All right. So this one is entitled The Ark of Philistia. It's for Samuel 5. After the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they took it from the battleground at Ebenezer to the town of Ashdod. They carried the Ark of God into the temple of Dagon and placed it beside an idol of Dagon. But when the citizens of Ashdod went to see it the next morning, Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him in his place again. <laughs> but the next morning, the same thing happened. Dagon had fallen face down before the ark of the Lord again. This time his head and hands had broken off and were lying in the doorway. Only the trunk of his body was left intact. That is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor anyone who enters the temple of Dagon in Ashdod will step on its threshold. Then the Lord's heavy hand struck the people of Ashdod and the nearby villages with a plague of tumors. When the people realized what was happening, they cried out, we can't keep the ark of God in Israel here any longer. He is against us. We will be destroyed along with Dagon, our God. So they called together the rulers of the Philistine towns and asked, 
What should we do with the ark of God in Israel? The rulers discussed it and replied, move it to the town of Gath. So they moved the ark of the God the ark of the God of Israel to Gath. But when the ark arrived at Gath, the Lord's heavy hand fell on its men, young and old. He struck them with a plague of tumors and there was a great panic. So they sent the ark of God to the town of Ekron. But when the people of Ekron saw it coming, they cried out, they're bringing the ark of God of Israel here to kill us too. The people summoned the Philistine rulers again and begged them, please send the ark of the God of Israel back to its own country, or it will kill us all. For the daily plague from God had already begun, and great fear was sweeping across the town. Those who didn't die were afflicted with tumors, and the cry from the town rose to heaven. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 6. The Ark of the Lord remained in the Philistine territory seven months in all. Then the Philistines called in their priests and diviners and asked them, what should we do about the Ark of the Lord? Tell us how to return it to its own country. <laughs> Send the Ark of the God of Israel back with a gift, they were told. <laughs> Send a guilt offering so the plague will stop. Then, if you are healed, you will know it was his hand that caused the plague. What sort of guilt offering should we send, they asked. And they were told, since the plague has struck both you and your five rulers, make five gold tumors and five gold rats, just like those that have ravaged your land. Make those things to show honor to the God of Israel, perhaps. Then he will stop afflicting you, your gods, and your land. Don't be stubborn and rebellious as Pharaoh and the Egyptians were. By the time God was finished with them, they were eager to let Israel go. Now build a new cart. And find two cows that have just given birth to calves. Make sure the cows have never been yoked to a cart. Hitch the cows to the cart, but shut their calves away from them in a pen. Put the ark of the Lord on the cart, and beside it place a chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors you are sending as a guilt offering. Then let the cows go wherever they want. If they cross the border of our land and go to Beth Shemesh, we will know it was the Lord who brought this great disaster upon us. If they don't, we will know it was not his hand that caused this plague. It came simply by chance. So these instructions were carried out. Two cows were hitched to the cart and their newborn calves were shut up in a pen. Then the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors were placed on the cart. Sure enough, without veering off in other directions, the cows went straight along the road toward Beth Shemesh lowing as they went. The Philistine rulers followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. The people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley, and when they saw the ark, they were overjoyed. <laughs> the cart came into the field of a man named Joshua and stopped beside a large rock. So the people broke up the wood of the cart for a fire and killed the cows and sacrificed them to the Lord as a burnt offering. Several men of the tribe of Levi lifted the ark of the Lord in the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors from the cart and placed them on the large rock. Many sacrifices and burnt offerings were offered to the Lord that day by the people of Beth Shemesh. The five Philistine rulers watched all this and then returned to Ekron that same day. The five gold tumors sent by the Philistines as a guilt offering to the Lord were gifts from the rulers of Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gaz, and Ekron. The five gold rats represented the five Philistine towns in their surrounding villages, which were controlled by the five rulers. The large rock at Beth Shemesh 
where they said the Ark of the Lord still stands in the field of Joshua as a witness to what happened there. But the Lord killed 70 men from Beth Shemesh because they looked into the Ark of the Lord. And the people mourned greatly because of what the Lord had done. Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? They cried out, where can we send the ark from here? So they sent messengers to the people at Kiriath Jerim and told them, the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come here and get it. <laughs> First Samuel 7. So the men of Kiriath Jerim came to get the ark of the Lord. They took it to the hillside home of Abinadab and ordered Eleazar, his son, to be in charge of it. The ark remained at kiriath Jerem for a long time, 20 years in all. During that time, all Israel mourned because it seemed the Lord had abandoned them. Then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, if you want to return to the Lord with all your hearts, get rid of your foreign gods, in your images of Ashtaroth. Turn your hearts to the Lord and obey him alone. Then he will rescue you from the Philistines. So the Israelites got rid of their images of Baal, Ashtaroth, and worshipped only the Lord. Then Samuel told them, gather all, the is gather all of Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah in a great ceremony, drew water from a well and poured it out before the Lord. They also went without food all day and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. It was at Mizpah that Samuel became Israel's judge. When the Philistine rulers heard that Israel had gathered at Mizpah, they mobilized their army and advanced. The Israelites were badly frightened when they learned that the Philistines were approaching. Don't stop pleading with the Lord our God to save us from the Philistines, they begged Samuel. So Samuel took a young lamb and offered it to the Lord as a whole burnt offering. He pleaded with the Lord to help Israel and the Lord answered him. Just as Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. But the Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day, and the Philistines were thrown into such confusion that the Israelites defeated them. The men of Israel chased them from Mizpah to a place below Beth Car, slaughtering them all along the way. Samuel then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jeshana. He named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. For he said, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and didn't invade Israel again for some time. And throughout Samuel's lifetime, the Lord's powerful hand was raised against the Philistines. The Israelite villages near Ekron and Gath and the Philistines had captured that the Philistines had captured were restored to Israel along with the rest of the territory that the Philistines had taken. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites in those days. Samuel continued as Israel's judge for the rest of his life. Each year he traveled around, setting up his court first at Bethel, then at Gilgal, and then at Mizpah. He judged the people of Israel at each of these places. Then he would return home at Ramah, and he would hear cases there too. And Samuel built an altar to the Lord at Ramah. First Samuel chapter 8. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel, Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba, but they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. 
give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied. They are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly sworn them about the way a king will reign over them. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops. And some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from, the ki from this king you are demanding. But then the Lord will not help you. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king. They said, we want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. Then Samuel agreed, sent the people Wow. <laughs> First, you know, the Ark of the Covenant was there with the Philistines and God demonstrated his power because he knew that is not where he belonged. He didn't belong to them. He was not their God. He knew that. And then they finally, you know, the Ark of the Covenant gets back to to Israel. And um, you know, now they're they're wanting someone uh, physically that they can see something tangible and that they can see to move over them. God told Samuel, give them what they want. And he had to remind Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. I think that's important to remember in this day, in the days to come, right? As we are preparing for the return of our bridegroom, right? That's, that's what we have to remember. We are preparing for the return of the bridegroom. We want to be like those five virgins, five bridesmaids who had extra oil, right? So. Um, <laughs> may we always remember who is our king. But we have leaders here on this earth now, and we are to pray for them. We are to pray for the people who have rule over us. These are the things that have been set in place. But remember that God is still always in charge. He is not ignorant of what is happening. But it is in his will and in his plan because eventually it will lead us all, lead us all back to him. That every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Well, I pray that you were blessed and encouraged by this word today. Um, feel free to go back and reread it again and ask the Lord to reveal himself 
to you. All right. We love you with the love of the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us. Have an amazing day. And we speak shalom, shalom to your life. Thank you.